Um, so arterial ischemia of the upper extremity, there we go, is interesting because it's different than the legs, right? The legs are pretty universal in terms of what's happening, right? It's thrombus, arterial disease from atherosclerosis or emboli and such. And the upper extremity is much more diverse, right? A lot of different things affect the arm, much less likely to be just garden variety atherosclerotic disease. And I think it's really kind of regional and practice-based. So when I was in training in Chicago, lots of cold weather, people with cold hands, Renaud's uh, syndrome and stuff, lots of people worried about their fingers going white and blue. Texas, almost never really an issue for that, right? Not, not nearly as much of that in Houston. Um, here, huge dialysis access practice, right? So for us, our upper extremity ischemia, very likely related to be some of the maneuvers we've performed, others have performed uh, trying to establish and maintain dialysis access. Um, we have a huge uh, transplant program, big ICU, lots of interarterial devices, lots of upper extremity uh, injuries from those, unfortunately. So lots of problems with iatrogenic trauma. Um, if you look overall, though, the more common causes are really vasospastic, all uh, right? So vasospastic, vasoclusive, large vessel, small vessel. So if we think about this in relation to lower extremity, much less common, right? The upper extremity more tolerant of less flow than the lower extremity seems to be. So one to nine is the ratio that's been given. Uh, small vessel disease more common than large vessel disease, right? So it's not, unless you're talking about arterial TOS or something else, you're not talking about usually uh, proximal upper extremity vessels giving you problems. Um, you're talking about more small vessel distal stuff, which makes it more challenging, at least if you're trying to approach it from a surgical standpoint. So large vessel occlusive disease, not so common. So, so typically not a surgical answer um, for many of these issues. Is it rolling or clicking? This, oh, not this. Oh, it's not the mouse at all. No wonder. Okay. All right. Carry on then. Um, so, like I said, in our practice, very common to see upper extremity ischemia uh, related to steel more commonly than the others. Um, and you can see somebody with missing digits and such. Um, we'll talk more about that in the next session. Drug-induced vasospasm, not too common, but a pretty tragic problem if it happens, particularly if somebody gets an upper extremity arterial infusion of something. That can be a really, really terrible problem for people that will cause them to lose uh, sometimes tissue and many times function because the hand can be very unforgiving uh, for neurologic uh, compromise from infused agents into arterial. I've um, seen several of those. So if somebody gets an IV and it's not IV, it's intraarterial action, they get drugs infused, that's a, that's a really tragic problem. Uh, thromboembolism obviously can happen. Upper extremity gets affected from that quite a bit. And again, the Renaud's disease. And is it vasoclusive or vasospastic? Um, so when you're looking at the hand, I think it's a, one of the really important things, right, is not just to look at, and that kind of goes for everywhere else, not just look at the bad foot, but look at the good foot too. How good is a good foot? Is a good foot good? Or, good foot looks terrible or missing, that gives you an idea of what's about to happen on the side you're looking at. Same thing goes with the hands, right? If both hands are atrophic looking like this with all kinds of muscle wasting, that's a bad problem that you probably don't have a surgical fix for. Um, but seeing what's happening on the other side is going to be pretty predictive of what's happening on this side or maybe predictive for that side later. Um, what else is going on? Feeling for the pulses, very important not just to feel for the radial pulse, right? But to feel for the brachial pulse, feel carotid pulses, because um, sometimes there can be lots of other conditions that are going on. Discoloration, ulcerations are usually pretty obvious. Neurologic function you've gone over, but if somebody's got compromise, addressing them and the acuity that you, uh, uh, that you kind of perceive and act upon can be really largely influenced by what nerves are involved. So people with median nerve injuries um, and other things from what seem like relatively mild ischemia can get really dramatic. And unfortunately, those nerves many times do not fully recover. So recognizing somebody with median ulnar or, or radial nerve dysfunction, really important. And then thinking about how aggressive you're going to be for doing that. Do they need decompression if they have an arterial uh, embolism or something else? And then what, what all they had before, really important. And again, the bilaterality of this is uh, really key, especially in access, I would say. Uh, so diagnostic studies really needs to be your, your history and your exam. Your history and your exam should tell you uh, for the great majority of these patients what's going on, what the etiology is, and what the um, magnitude of it is, and how much intervention you need to be and how aggressive. Uh, duplex sonography really should be to help augment your exam and I think hopefully to confirm what you're already suspecting. Segmental pressure is not as commonly done. We do do digital pressures pretty commonly. Um, looking at pulse volume recordings, uh, and then non-invasive versus invasive angiography. 
Uh, much more common now, I'd say, to do non-invasive for the proximal vessels, but for really looking at distal vessels, still selective angiography plays the big role. All right, we don't usually rely on CT or MR if we're going to go out beyond the elbow. Um, so duplex sonography, this is a patient that has actually access, and you can see that it's not a normal duplex waveform, right? So it's got lots of high flow in the diastolic distribution. This is somebody with uh, dialysis access, um, actually Dr. One, one of Dr. Wynn's patients, um, and it's proximal to the access, lots of diastolic flow, uh, reasonable upstroke, and then if you go distal, almost no diastolic flow, right? And just these little monophasic blips uh, that happen distally. Uh, with sometimes some reversal, and the further down you go, the same thing. So you don't have occlusive problem. You just have really poor flow going below. Um, so we're the same thing. If you compress then, then you get some more diastolic flow back, and that's one of the things we look at, that and what happens to the digital pressures. So in this one, with flow in the graft and a digital uh, 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 sensor, we have very little flow. If we compress then, uh, get float, pulse style flow back, and then comparing that to the other side, where say we also have pulse still flow, really important. Um, so angiography can be, CT angiography can be really good, I think, especially with reconstructed uh, imaging. And here you can see that somebody has proximal subclavian disease. And I think it's important that you kind of perceive this in, in all the patients. So again, a good pulse exam should give you a good clue that this is going on. You can have distal pulses with proximal occlusions, but not quite as commonly. I would say. So this you really should suspect, hopefully if you've done bilateral arm blood pressures, um, that also gives you a good clue of this, right? Because we expect a drop of 20 or more uh, millimeters of mercury. And then pretty common to see this sort of thing. So even in dialysis patients, you can't assume that it's just from steel related to their dialysis graft itself. It might be related to underlying arterial disease. Um, selective angiography, again, can be really helpful, especially going distally. And here you can see somebody's got lots of distal disease down the forearm, which again is a really challenging problem, particularly in the dialysis patients. When patients get uh, lots of distal disease down the hand, that becomes not really a vascular surgery thing that you can help with, and sometimes not even something that the microsurgery team can help with. But seeing really good flow out here, you're not going to get nearly as well with CT or MR. And again, selective angiography, really helpful to do magnified, selected, subtracted moves. It's a challenge when you're doing that, though, particularly depending on what contrast agent you're choosing, because the further you go selective distally, uh, the more they're going to feel that, and they'll feel the burn of contrast of using Omnipake or one of the more um, higher osmolar uh, agents. So either diluting that or using one of the lower or isosmolar like Visipake, uh, much more helpful to get distal arterial imaging when you're doing your selective angiography. So reactive hyperemia, right, so doing some sort of occlusive maneuver, uh, leaving that occlusive with a blood pressure cuff or your hand or something else, and then releasing that and seeing how much they get. Interarterial vasodilators, not commonly done. Uh, so reactive hyperemia was kind of described initially for patients that were getting arter arteriography in the days before subtraction. So I'd put a blood pressure cuff up on the arm or leg, leave that up for a few minutes, then let it down, then inject the dye in the reactive uh, vasodilatation. Uh, to get better imaging, interarterial vasodilators not commonly done unless you're really having problems seeing. Uh, subtraction angiography really has uh, has made that helpful. And cold immersion testing, well, we've got some of our vascular lab people here. When was the last time it wasn't that? <laughs> yeah, it's just almost not done anymore, right? It's kind of cruelty to hold people's hands that are already painful and stuff down <laughs> in ice water and see how long it's going to take them to get blood flow back to their fingers. They they don't enjoy doing it. I don't think people enjoy doing the test. Um, but usually with uh, the duplex imaging and then segmental pressures, you can see what you need to see from that. Um, so occlusive lesions depends on what's occluded, right? Uh, if somebody's had embolic events down distally, uh, sometimes anticoagulation is enough. If it's a big proximal vessel, sometimes thrombolysis or, or surgical thrombectomy can be done. Um, if people have had cardioembolic events, that's much more likely to be lodged in a, in a big vessel proximally. If they've had a you know, subclavian aneurysm or some other arterial uh, lesion that then is distalized down to the form of the hand, much less likely to be rewarding to go after that with thrombectomy, and probably the person is going to be left with uh, anticoagulation to see. But for big proximal vessels, that can be really helpful. Um, and typically, you think about cardioembolic uh, lesions landing at some sort of bifurcation point, right? So landing where the profunda brachia comes off, landing down at the arterial bifurcation at the elbow, et cetera. Uh, percutaneous revascularization uh, uh, for proximal lesions, certainly helpful for distal lesions, not. And distal bypasses in the upper extremity, pretty uncommon, right? Pretty uncommon, just because of the size of the vessels and such. 
So here's another case uh, from Dr. Wynn where somebody's had an embolic event and has lodged clot nail at the uh, subclavian just beyond where the vertebral's at. Um, and then after surgical embolectomy and exposure, are able to retrieve the clot. Uh, and those can be done. Uh, you gotta be careful about doing that though, that you don't wanna knock clot obviously up into the vertebral. That would be a really bad thing to have a posterior stroke. Um, exposure of the brachial artery bifurcation, uh, I would say you can just blindly explore it. But in almost every operating room area that you guys are gonna be exposed to, there's an ultrasound available, right? Is the bifurcation at the elbow? Is it below the elbow? Is it uh, halfway up the arm? Is it all the way in the axilla? So about 10% of patients we know from anatomic studies have a high arterial bifurcation, meaning above the um, anacubital region. And if you're exploring blindly, you may miss that. And sometimes they're deep under the pronatus group to find the ulnar. And remember, ulnar is usually the dominant flow down to the hand. So just looking with ultrasound beforehand helps you plan your open surgeries as well. So finding that, uh, usually through a longitudinal incision so you can expose further distally and proximal if you need to. Arteriotomies, longitudinal versus transverse. Probably the faculty would disagree <laughs> about that, yeah. Um, if, if you're fairly convinced from your history and your physical of what's going on, I personally prefer to do a transverse, right? It closes easier, you don't have to put a patch on or I love doing hand. longitudinal. He took my slides, I gotta say something. <laughs> You know, when you do arteriotomy, if you do a longitudinal ar arteriotomy, you can see everything better. You just she likes to, to make it hard. It. I like to make it easy. I yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so if you're pretty convinced that it's, a, uh, that it's an arterial embolus, then a transverse is fine. I can tell you, just this weekend, I, I had one where I'm sure Dr. Wynn would have looked over my shoulder and said, I told you you should have done <laughs> longitudinal. We're fishing out some black and then try to deal with it through the transverse was a challenge. You can convert a transverse arteriotomy into a longitudinal, I would say, quite easily, right? A couple of interrupteds on each side and then extend up and down. So, so nothing lost. But you have to do what you have to do. That's for sure, right? You have to retrieve the clot. You have to restore patency. And you really want to do some kind of completion imaging if you don't have uh, excellent pulses. If you have excellent pulses, you're probably done. Uh, so again, for myself, for an embolus, I would say a transverse. Um, I do like to make it close to the... Um, branch points so I can individually uh, embolectomize those. Patch closure, again, not neat if you do transverse. Um, and then anticoagulation, depending on what's happening and uh, what's that from. Uh, so if it's from AFib or something, then probably they should be. And here, just showing clot that you can extrude from one of the lumens, you can get lots of clot out of these patients. Um, and it's, it's really important to do that. Again, with the transverse and nice incision, I like putting a suture at both sides, kind of pulling it open and then closing that with either interrupteds or continuous, depending on where you do it. You can over-tighten your suture, so careful not to do that, especially on these upper extremity vessels. Uh, when I do radio artery embolectomies for ICU patients that have had art lines put in without checking that they actually had an ulnar pulse or um, intact Allen's test, I personally like to do a transverse like this and then interrupted 7 proline suture uh, to close those. That's, that's a small vessel to patch. You patch those, Tam? You do that longitudinal and patch those? I, I, I longitudinal everything. Everything. Man. Purist. I, I just, Purist. Just straight to I love the patch. it. <laughs> All right. No questions with Tam. Okay. Yeah. So there's her beautiful patchwork at the right. Almost never see that. Just got to steal her pictures of that. Um, so you can do proximal arterial stinting again in subclavian. Works quite nicely. This would make me a little nervous crossing across the vertebral origin, obviously, right? Um, it has been shown that uh, stenting is fairly durable. It is not as durable as carotid uh, axillary or carotid subclavian bypass grafting, uh, to kind of keep that in mind. Uh, the arteritides, so takiyasu is uh, fairly uncommon for you to see these things in your practice, I would say, right? We know for takiyasus, you do not want to operate on somebody in the acute phase. You want to get them through the acute phase, right, with corticosteroids and immunosuppressants. Um, again, thinking about that in terms of younger uh, women, uh, Asian uh, descent more commonly, a reconstruction for a delayed thing, right? Giant cellulitis. Um, uh, again, so older, older people, women more than men, again, not to tr be treated surgically in the acute phase, not to be treated generally with stents, but with surgical reconstruction much more commonly, and just in the chronic occlusive phases. Uh, so for non-occlusive um, ischemia patients that are on causative agents or on ergots or excess caffeine, et cetera, typically to try and stop those agents. Nifedipine, Procardia is one the, that we most commonly prescribe to people. Um, topical agents can be really helpful, especially people in the ICU. Trying to get patients in the ICU that have ischemia all over to reverse that is a really challenging uh, problem because typically they're requiring uh, pressors and they're in shock, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and the point of this is that 
when people do have ischemia of the digits and such, uh, particularly in the ICU instincts, to delay that is typically better, unless that people have um, infection that pushes you. Because to, to amputate a digit like this one up here, you have to go down to healthy tissue. If you let that dry up and auto-amputate, then they're probably just gonna lose a little tip of the finger and instead of like, missing most of the digit or all the digit. Um, uh, uncommonly for people who don't have other reconstructive options to get your uh, plastic surgery colleagues involved and sometimes we'll do arterialization of the venous system. Uh, sympathectomy, either proximal or periarterial sympathectomy can be helpful for people with non-reconstructable uh, small vessel disease, um, et cetera. So here's somebody who's got uh, discoloration. We know that when you have Renaud's, right, the typical sequence is you get white, right, or pallor first, right, from the vasospasm. Then as that loosens, you get sort of a bluish uh, discoloration, and then pink later with reactive hyperemia as things come. Um, also really problematic in the ICU when patients have ischemia is in the, you know, all the finger sticks, right? And you see the finger sticks, then all of a sudden start turning black, and that, that can be a real challenge for people. Uh, again, in the ICU, people on lots of pressors, that's a real problem. If you will let them auto-amputate, frequently they'll be left with just uh, small pieces of finger that are missing rather than the entire digits. So letting that happen is better. Hypothene or hammer, right? People with jackhammer, right? So jackhammer that the ulnar artery uh, passes over the prominence uh, there on the palm uh, at the wrist with the bony prominence, and then you can get aneurysmal degeneration can present with a big bulge like this, more commonly presents with digital ischemia though, right? That you'll see bluish discoloration, sometimes embolic spots, uh, but picking that up on exam and then confirming that with subtraction and angiography really helpful. Your microsurgery colleagues can go in and actually replace that vessel if needed. Um, yeah, so here's a great picture from Tam from last year. So lots of work this poor guy's had done. What's the diagnosis? I have to hold my hand. All right, I think that's the gong. <laughs> so again, really diverse uh, etiology for this. Um, not frequently things you're going to operate on, but things you need to be diagnostic of. Sometimes you'll be the one to make the diagnosis of connective tissue disorder that the person has lupus or crest or scleroderma or some other problem, and you go for and look for those. All right.